Hello everyone, this is John Moore from the Denver Center, and today we're going to take you through the creation of three distinct costumes designed by Kevin Copenhaver and worn by actor and choreographer Christine Rowan in the Denver Center Theater Company's new production of Animal Crackers. Kevin, let's start with you. How long have you been at the Denver Center? I've been here for 23 seasons. Uh, I, I run the costume craft shop and then I also design shows. Christine, when did you first come to the Denver Center? My first show was Christmas Carol in 2005. Okay, so let's have some fun. Christine, let's take the first of your three characters and tell people how you and Kevin brought her to life. All right, this is Arabella Rittenhouse. She is the daughter of the, the matron of the house who is throwing a big party. She's a little bit of a, a spitfire. She's got a little uh, spunk to her. And this is the character that tap dances, so that was definitely taken into consideration costume-wise. And uh, she falls in love with the uh, Wally Winston character, who is a writer for a local paper. It's hard not to fall in love with the writer for the local paper. <laughs> <laughs> so, Kevin, how do you start with that information and come up with this design? A lot of fun came with this show in, in watching movies from the period. Not only Marx Brothers movies, but, you know, the 30s was just, it's a, a mine full of wonderful films. I can tell you right now, like, the sort of the, the neckline on, on this, this dress is inspired by uh, a dress that Billy Burke wears in Dinner at Eight. Because it's, it's such an unusual neckline. And, you know, it, the bow adds a little bit of of a demure quality to an otherwise sort of, you know, flashy and daring neckline. And that's Arabella. She doesn't hold her tongue. She has sort of a sweet naughtiness about her. Mm -hmm. Christine, um, what, was the, so, what was the first thing that came to your mind when you saw the sketch? I thought it was fabulous. It looked so fun. And it looked flowy. I could tell I could turn well in it, so... Mm -hmm. The colors um, are great. Colors are great, and I thought the neckline was so... I've never seen anything like it. Women in bow ties. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but see, we have we have a lot of decolletage going on there. I don't know, know what that just, means. What's this decolletage? is all this open area right here, okay. so, so it's, you know... Steamy. It's steamy. Yeah, yeah, it is kind of sultry, but it's flirty, too, you know. So here's a, another thing I didn't know, is that we start with... Muslin. We use muslin because it's relatively inexpensive. When we start these mock-up fittings, you can see there's a, there's a ton of pins that we've pinned out to, to fit the dress to, to Christine. And then I also, one of my favorite tools is a Sharpie marker, because I love to draw directly on the muslin mock-up, you know, if, if we want to raise the hemline or change a style line or imagine that there will be a belt here and a belt buckle. You know, I, I love to draw on the mock-ups. You draw <laughs> an awful lot on the mock-ups. I do. I, I do. It's true. Christine, what's it, what's it like to be drawn upon? <laughs> <laughs> it's like I'm his little uh, paper doll. <laughs> it's a, you know, it's, a, it's another sort of palette, really. <laughs> Mrs. Whitehead is a neighbor of Mrs. Rittenhouse's. I do believe that she and Mrs. Rittenhouse are trying to see who can have the best summer parties. And so Mrs. Whitehead and her sister, Grace, come into the party with the expectation of making sure that Mrs. Rittenhouse's party goes sour somehow. <laughs> this was the first time I saw you in this, and this was nothing like the color of mm -hmm. what the actual dress was going to mm -hmm. to look like. And Kevin, what was the purpose of this fabric at this point in the process? Well, Stephanie Cooper, who made, who made this garment, chose very wisely to mock this dress up in a fabric that would somewhat resemble the real fabric that we were going to use for the finished costume. So that's why, uh, you, you know, you're looking at something that's a different color and whatnot. But this this very inexpensive fabric behaved much better than if we had used muslin. And then we start to see the infusion of color. Yeah, that's that's the underdress, um, that sort of chartreuse limey green. This fabric that's over it is really great. It's a cut velvet on chiffon penne. It's very luminous 
And it's a sheer fabric, which is why I chose to, uh, of course, do an underdress. Christine, by the time you add in the, the coat and you get the, the full effect here, that's quite a production. It is. It's, it's <laughs> it quite, is quite a costume. A <laughs> it's a lot of costume. It's, I think it indicates, however, that the character put on so much. She's she's putting on airs to mm-hmm. try to... She's trying to impress. One up mm-hmm. Mrs. Rittenhouse by putting all of her best clothes on at the same time, <laughs> basically. <laughs> so it's, it's quite a costume. Kevin, what were your particular challenges going from the, the sketch to all the layers? Uh, Bruce wanted there to be some sort of reveal for this number called the Naughty Blues. And we weren't sure what that was. And then I, I sort of came up the, with the idea of using these coats and they sort of morphed through the rehearsal process. Right. And I'm looking at these pictures right now where I'm kind of flashing the green on the inside of yeah. this dress. Yeah. I choreographed a move into this number that opens the coats just like that because I thought the color was so cool on the inside. Mm-hmm. So there's an actual moment that's choreographed in so that we can flash and have bright color show. And we hold it for a couple of seconds just to kind of highlight yeah, that and it, that was not part of the choreography it was after I saw the code I thought oh how cool would it be if we did this okay let's go to your crowning achievement Madame du Barry is the mistress of King Louis in the fever dream that happens when Harpo chloroforms or gases everybody on the stage, and we all go into this sort of dream sequence. That makes total sense. Okay, great. (laughs) Well, it's like everybody has the same hallucination, which I think is really funny. Right. We go into a hallucination, which brings us to 17th century France. Everybody smoked the same peyote. Yeah, exactly. Whatever Harpo is spraying out of his bug sprayer, some sort of hallucinogen, (laughs) they're all transported, you know, to this sort of make-believe French court. Right. And Madame Dubarry is simply the mistress of the king. <laughs> and she is wearing a dress that you could rent out to boarders yes. if, you, <laughs> if you needed to. Kevin, talk us through what it takes to conceive and build a costume like this. Well, given that it's a hallucination, I took tremendous liberties. The silhouette with these huge panniers and this sort of corseted look you know, it's historically accurate. How we went about building this costume is completely not historically accurate by any stretch of the imagination. Um, At its very base, we're starting with foam. Yeah, yeah, it's a very dense foam that I use a lot for sort of, you know, character stuff, walk around character creatures and whatnot. And it seemed to make perfect sense to use it for this these outfits, given what what is required of these outfits. In the script, all of a sudden, this dress gets ripped off of the character on stage, revealing her in her underwear. So, in order to facilitate that change, I chose to go this route of making these sort of shells out of this foam material, which we then, in turn, sort of upholstered with fabric. So the effect on the outside looks as though, oh, yes, this character's wearing a corset and she's wearing these big side pieces called panniers, but it's not constructed remotely how it would have been in reality. What are the benefits of using foam? Is it to keep it light? Yeah, just to keep the shape, the silhouette, if you will. And at one point, I think I saw five different people working on Christine at the same time. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. This looks like we're in an industrial factory. Right. What's going on here? Okay, so Karen is using a soldering iron to (laughs) melt holes into this foam in which we inserted magnets. So because the costume had to get ripped off on stage, I didn't want to use Velcro, we didn't want to use zippers or anything. We used magnets as closures on the foam. And because it's a, a, you know toxic, of course, when you burn it, she's wearing a respirator. So, Christine, <laughs> you're, wearing, you're, you're, you're wearing a costume that involved a soldering gun, <laughs> some breath filtering <laughs> system, there's magnets inside, yeah. four or five different people. What was it like for you when you finally got it on? I mean, you couldn't get on a public bus. <laughs> no, you, she you can't, can't get do through much. the doorway. It, 
You know what? It's exciting. When's the last time you got to wear a costume like that, John? Um. Exactly. So this is what I do for a living. We play dress up. I play dress up. Mm-hmm. And it was a great... I, I was determined to make this work on the, my entrance in particular. To, and she does, beautifully. I had to come down a set of stairs in this costume. At what point do you stop, Kevin, and say, okay, that's enough? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. That's a good question. Um, I think I, I could always keep icing this cake. But, you know, in the context of the piece and what's happening in this scene, which throws everybody for the hugest loop imaginable, I think it's enough. We're only going through Christine's three characters, and there's mm-hmm. 27 or so more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. But this, I mean, this is the kind of thing that I love to do. I love to do period pieces. I love to do, you know, odd things like this. It, it, I think that's why I do what I do. The attention to detail that this costume shop does and the pride that they take in making sure that each costume does have its own story, it's pretty amazing. I, I don't know how they do it. Well, thanks, Kevin and Christine, for joining us. And I want to remind everyone that Animal Crackers plays through May 11th in the Stage Theater Call 303-893-4100 or go to www.denvercenter.org.